Welcome to the GSMC Car Podcast, the show that takes you on a journey to the automotive world. We talk about the latest news, from new makes and models, to new technology, to all of the must-have options available. Whether you're a fan of the old classics, love the latest models and technology, or have never met a vehicle you didn't want to work on, the GSMC Car Podcast has something for every car enthusiast. Thank you for tuning in to the GSMC Car Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, David Lucy Mabel. All right, today, folks, we are going to be doing part two of our mini series on the beloved European Econic Car. The last part of this mini series, or I say in the first part, uh, which was the last podcast, we discussed the BMC Mini versus the Volkswagen Beetle. And we had what was basically sort of like a showdown of sorts. Um, in that um, podcast, I took one car, I discussed it for one segment, I discussed it for another segment. Um, I spent the other one. I discussed it for another segment, I should say. Uh, I spent the third segment comparing the two in the fourth segment. I gave you my personal thoughts, and then I chose a winner. So in this uh, podcast, it's going to be very much the same context, and this is going to be a wrap-up to our mini-series, this two-part series on the beloved European cars of old. So today, we are going to be talking about, um, we are going to be talking about the city Citroen 2CV, and we are going to be talking about the Fiat 500. Um, as you all know, the Citroen 2CV is a French uh, city car from back in the day, and the Fiat 500, not talking about the ones that they make now, um, Italian is city car from back in the day. So uh, let's get started. So we are going to start off with the Citroën 2CV, or as it's named in French, is the Citroën 2 Chevaux of Vapeur, which means um, two steam horses. Um, I guess this is uh, because the engine is a two-cylinder engine. It's not like it produces two horsepower. The car is not that old or that, um, I guess primitive for it to only produce two horsepower, but it's called the De Chevaux Vapeur, um, which means two steam horses, I guess after the fact that it has a two-cylinder engine. Uh, speaking of this two-cylinder engine, it's air-cooled, it's a front-engine, front-wheel drive car uh, produced from 1948 to 1990, um, and it was produced all over the world. Um, there was one manufacturing plant in France, two in Belgium, one in the UK, two in Argentina, one in Uruguay, one in Chile, one in Portugal, one in Spain, and one in Slovenia. Um, they, they built this car all over the place. They built it in Europe. They built it in South America. They built it in Eastern Europe. They built it there. They built it here. I mean, this was a very popular car, um, as you can clearly tell. And you will find that as I talk about the Citroën 2 Chevaux, and I talk about um, – and. In my podcast about the Volkswagen Beetle um, versus the BMC Mini, you will find that the T Citroën 2 Chevaux versus the Volkswagen Beetle, there are very sim there are similarities in the stories of the cars and what the car's purposes were. And really, all of these cars are similar, which is the reason why I decided to compare them anyway, because they're similar and they're different. They all have their unique stories. But at the end of the day, they are all city cars made by European car, uh, car companies companies a long time ago. So that's something that anybody would be interested in. Um, these came in several body types as well. Um, there was a four-door saloon, or as we would say in the United States, a sedan. Um, there's a five-hatch called the 3CV, so I can only imagine it's 
trois chevaux vapeur instead of deux chevaux vapeur. Maybe that one had three cylinders. Who knows? But it was called the three CV. Um, it was there was a two door panel van. Um, there was a two door pickup, which. I would really like to see, after seeing that in my research and seeing that in my notes, I would like to see what a Citroen 2CV pickup truck looks like. Um, I would see, like, it's like a French El Camino, I guess, because there's no way that it's an actual pickup truck with, like, body-on-frame construction like a truck chassis. So it's obviously like a coupe utility thing that I'm thinking about. So it's like a French El Camino. I... I guess that is somewhat interesting. I don't know if I, I don't know how attractive I, it would be, but I, I sure. Uh, anyway, moving on. <laughs> there is a two door coupe as well. Um, the engine produced nine to twenty nine horsepower, depending on the engine. All of them were flat twin engines. Um, flat twin, what they sound like? Flat engines with twin with twin cylinders. So they are flat two cylinder engines. That's what a flat twin engine is. Um, yeah, very simple. To work on, it was air-cooled, nothing fancy, got the car from point A to point B, um, which is basically what the purpose of these cars were. These purpose, The purposes of these cars was not to uh, make a lot of speed, was not to, oh dear me, was not to was not to impress anybody, frankly. The thing is, these cars were supposed to be cheap, easy to mass produce, and available to the, the masses as a whole. Um, these cars were not the ones you would take to your local drag strip. These are not the things that you would, you know, put um, mufflers on and then modify your engine and put, like, cold air intakes and what other... And these are not tuners. These are not your tuner cars. These are not your cars that you get and then you race. These, this is an economy car. Think of today's Ford Fiesta, for example. Then That's like France's Ford Fiesta back in the day. I mean, it, it doesn't really matter how many horsepower these engines had, but I thought I thought I should mention it nonetheless. Um, speaking of the specifications and whatnot, I should mention mention that this thing only weighed 1300 pounds think of that today 1300 pounds it weighed significantly less than a ton it was granted just over half a ton half a ton is 1000 pounds this thing weighed 1300 pounds that is crazy that is just to show you how small and how light these vehicles actually were. Even today, even with like the K cars in Japan, I don't think you can legally make a car that's that lightweight. Because not to say that it's illegal for the car to be, you know, light and not heavy. Um, I think it's just back in those days, there was not much safety equipment in cars, especially not in city cars, because these things were never expected to go fast. They were never expected to be, you know, driven at unsafe speeds. But I think as time progressed, and the safety regulations have been more stringent in cars, they've had to put things like airbags. They've had to put things like crumple zone technology and other sorts of that thing. I think cars have just naturally gotten larger, and that includes the economy cars as well. The economy cars have gotten heavier. But when you think of these economy cars of old, I mean, these things are bona fide death traps. Like, you don't want to drive one of these on today's roads. I mean, God forbid you run over a coconut and a Citroen 2C vegan. Honestly, they might as well, you know, have the coroner on speed dial with a full tank of gas to a graveyard of your choice. I mean, like, it's it's not going to end up pretty. But it, it's just super lightweight. Super lightweight. There was nothing, there was no, oh, crumple zones, oh, airbags, oh, this, oh, that, seatbelts, nah, nah, nah. No, 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 no. There was none of that. I mean, as the car progressed, obviously, it got those things as it progressed in its history, but these were not things that were from the design of the car from the very beginning. And and mind you, this car was produced in a single generation from 19, like, 48 to 1990. So that's that's a good 42 years. That's what I mean. So you would you would imagine that in order for them to modernize the car, they would have to come out with us a completely new version of it or just a completely new model to replace this one anyway. There's no there's no modifying a 42 year old chassis by the time it's done. I mean, there's no modifying that. You just have to scrap it and create a new one. So um, moving on. Sorry about that. Was like a little rant about safety and whatnot. Um, it was 152 inches long, which let's do the math real quick let me pull up my handy dandy calculator over here so 
152 inches divided by 12. That is 12.7 feet, just about. Can you believe that? This thing was only about 12 to 13 feet long. And then let's see how wide it was. It was 58.3 inches wide. So 58.3 divided by 12 to find out how many feet that is. That, God gracious goodness, that is hilarious. This was 4.86 feet long. So just about five feet wide. So th this thing was about 12 feet long, 12, 13 feet long, and only five feet wide. That thing was tiny, really tiny. I mean, it's not like it's a mini over here. A mini, you know, looks small on the outside, but it's actually really big. Now, the Citroen 2 Chevo was, was small. Like, it was small. Um, and, and plus, it's a French car. French cars have never been known for being big anyway. I mean, it is a European car at the end of the day. European cars are just small. But this is a European economy car. So it just takes that whole European cars are small sort of deal to, like, the next level. Um, but let's talk about more of the history of the Citroën uh, de Chevaux. Um, it was conceived by Pierre Boulanger, which, fun fact, Boulanger... Um, that last name means baker, in, in case if you all wanted to know. Um, I'm, I'm Haitian, so I understand French. I speak a bit of French, but I'm mostly, I understand Creole mostly. But, you know, in order for you to speak Creole, you must, you know, kind of learn French. But anyways, that's besides the point. That's not related to cars, but just Pierre Boulanger, his name is Peter Baker, if you were to translate that into English. So, good old Baker over here, um, vice president of Citroën, wanted to mobilize the large number of French farmers that were still using horse and buggies in the 1930s. So basically, France was behind in getting, you know, automobiles to the masses. And so he's like, you know what? Why don't we create a car for the people? Guess who also did that? Hitler. Um, I'm not saying that as like a cruel joke. No, Hitler actually said that in Germany. He wanted to create a car for the people so they could take advantage of Germany's new road system. So he commissioned the Volkswagen Beetle to be made. Uh, Pierre Boulanger was not an official of government. He was an official of the Citroën Motor Company. But he said, look, there's a lot of people still using horse and buggies. We need to make a car that is affordable for them so they can use it. And get this, he designed it in such a way that not only would it be cheap and affordable for these people, it would also be designed in such a way that the top would open up so it'd be able to carry all sorts of cargo either. It was what you call a fixed profile convertible. Um, and up in 1955, you can take down this convertible top from the top almost all the way down to the rear bumper. So the entire top and back of the car would open up because it was a can this top and then you would just open it up and then you could put all sorts of foolishness in there i mean this thing was so practical despite being small it was so practical so fuel efficient i mean this is how they sold these cars was the fact that they were so dang practical and so fuel efficient they they, they replaced the horse and buggy for a lot of french farmers when they needed to haul their stuff to market or whatnot these cars were able to do that which is quite amazing when you actually really think about it um moving on it, it was, uh, oh dear, it, ah, Michelin. Michelin, which is a French tire company, as you all know, um, Michelin introduced and first, you know, commercialized the radio tire design on a Citroën 2 Chevaux. So essentially, cars used to have bias ply tires a long time ago and finally made a radio tire. Michelin brought this radio tire to market on the Citroën 2 Chevaux. So you can say that the T Citroën 2 Chevaux, 2 CV, whatever you want to call it, was one of the first cars, was one of the first cars, folks, that had radial tires. Now, I know that's not a huge deal because every car has radial tires these days, but we're talking about 1948 here, where radial tires did not come, you know, very common, probably until the late 50s, mid 60s. Uh, so this car was ahead of its time in, in several ways. Like, you know, I know that nowadays we don't think so much of economy cars as being ahead of their time. Economy cars these days are frankly kind of behind their time. But this car was different. These 
economy cards in general. I'm talking about the ones from the first part of this series in the last podcast and today on the Citroen 2 Chevo and Fiat 500. I mean, these cars were ahead of their time in, in a variety of ways. And the fact, you know, the proof is in the pudding, if you want to put it that way. Uh, one of those here that has radial tires. Every car today has radio tires, but most cars back then didn't. So it was ahead of its time in that sense. Um, so moving on from that, there was about 3.8 million um, Citroen 2 Civos were created. And actually, the fun fact is the Chrysler CCV, which is concept commercial vehicle or something like that. It wasn't concept commercial vehicle. It was like a commercial concept vehicle, something about Chrysler. I really don't care. It's a Chrysler. But anyway, I thought I should uh, show you this. The Chrysler CCV concept car was a mid-90s concept car that said it was inspired by the design of the two chevaux. So it was like a modern rendition of their interpretation of the two chevaux. So it not only inspired, you know, other European car companies, other car companies across, you know, the globe, it also inspired Chrysler as well. Uh, too bad Chrysler never brought it to fruition. Why? Because Chrysler doesn't do anything right. But moving on, um, it garnered, and my French teacher in high school said that these things are still, you know, it, it, a fairly common sight in, in France. I mean, given how old they are that people just keep them they preserve them they they restore them just like we we know we do classic cars here in america so i think that's um absolutely wonderful so um please stay tuned for the next segment in which we talk about the fiat 500 what are the specs what are this what are that everything you need to know essentially about the fiat 500 so please stay tuned Are you a business owner? Someone interested in the latest news that might affect your business? Then check out the GSMC Business News Podcast, a show dedicated to keeping you up to date on all things concerning business, technology, and the stock market. Get a head start on the day as we keep you updated on the latest goings on on Wall Street, money, jobs, and technology. The GSMC Business News Podcast has you covered. All right. Welcome back, folks. Um, in the last segment, we spoke about the Citroën 2 Chevaux or the Citroën 2 CV, um, which is a French economy car from, you know, this time period that we are discussing, uh, the economy cars of old. So now we are going to be talking about the beloved Fiat 500. Um, I know many of you all who are listening to this podcast are American, and we are going to be talking about basically the ancestor of the new cute little Fiat 500 that's been zipping around American roads for the past, uh, you know, eight or nine years or so since Fiat Chrysler became a thing and they brought the Fiat 500 to America in its modern form. Um, so essentially what the Fiat 500 is, um, it was produced in Italy from 1957 to 1975. Now, this is kind of interesting because of all these iconic European cars of old, this one was produced, you think the Swaggin in its original form was produced for probably the longest amount of time from 1938 to 2003 and then you had the BMC Mini that was like 1959 to 2000 then you had the Citroen 2 Chevaux which was 1948 to 1990 this one was only produced for 18 years I mean granted 18 years for a car to be unchanged is a long time but not nearly as long as the others but then again goodness this is also an Italian company now I'm not saying this because I have anything against Italian cars. I think Italian cars are absolutely gorgeous. They always have been, always will be. But 
you know, Fiat may have faced some financial difficulty, as is typical of Italian companies, um, Italian car companies, as we've seen the history has shown us. So perhaps maybe that could be the reason why they ended up stopping to produce the Fiat 500, or maybe they just came out with another version of it. Who knows? Um, but that's this generation, uh, this Fiat 500 that we know and love so much, the one that the modern one is based on, was only produced for 18 years, from 57 to 75. But in that time period, they produced over 3 million. Now, think of it this way. Of course, I haven't moved to the comparison stage just yet, but the Citroën 2 Chevaux sold about 3 million from 1948 to 1990. So these were produced at a much faster rate than the French Citroën. But um, moving on from that, uh, it had an I2 engine. The I2 engine was air-cooled, and just like if you listen to my podcast about engines, you will find that the I2 engine is a twin-cylinder engine, but instead of it being flat, this is inline. So these cylinders are in the same line. Um, moving on to specs. Um, the length was 116.9 inches. So let's just whip out the handy dandy calculator again and see how much 116.9 inches is in feet. So 116.9 divided by 12. And that is, get this, we thought the other one was small. That is nine, eight feet just about. That is crazy. The Fiat 500 was less than 10 feet long. I mean, there you can fit this in a lot of things. I mean, like, heck, you could fit that in a lot of things. I think this is smaller than, like, today's Smart 4-2 or something, like, Smart Car, which is, like, our typical, you know, thing of when we think of city car. Like, this is less than 10 feet long. I didn't even realize how small these cars were. And let's figure out how wide they were. They were 50, 52 inches wide, so divided by 12, that's 4.3. They were about 4.3 inches wide and just less than 10 feet long. So that's what that's sort of what we were dealing with. And if we thought the two chevaux was light, this one was 1,100 pounds. That is just about half a ton. This thing weighed absolutely nothing. I mean, as far as power to weight distribution, this thing probably had amazing power to weight distribution because it barely made any power, but it barely weighed anything. So this thing probably actually responded fairly well. It probably wasn't extremely, you know, slow. Like we tend to think of these cars probably as being very slow and probably dangerous to drive, which granted, I mean, in modern times, yes, they're very slow. But back in those days, no, them cars probably picked up and accelerated just as better, just as much as all the other cars. Because cars at that time tend to be underpowered as compared to today's cars anyway. And cars tended to be a lot larger then. I mean, small city cars were not the norm. So you have things like your big old Cadillacs, or this is Europe, so I don't know, your your big old Jaguars or something, whatever the big cars in Europe are, and then you are driving around in something like that versus something like this. You're probably getting, you know, the same amount of acceleration from a small car as you are from a large car because of the simple fact that these things weighed almost nothing, so they didn't have to produce a lot of power to move that sheer bulk around because they just simply didn't have it. Um, the new version of the Fiat 500 um, was launched on the 50th anniversary. The new one has been produced since 2007 for about 13 years. The original produced was for about 18 years. So when you really think of it, the new one has been produced for almost as long as the old one was produced for. Um, it has its roots in the Fiat Topolino, which uh, came before it. So there was a Fiat 500 Topolino, which is another city car that Fiat produced. Um, it was another cute little car, and maybe I might do like a, a podcast cast on it in the in the way future but basically it was the ancestor to this one but not as popular in design i guess like this one was kind of like the contemporary of the volkswagen beetle of the two chevaux of the bmc mini these cars are all sort of the same same kind of sort of car but they've been 
I guess, interpreted differently by different cultures, by different car companies. So you like, you know, Germany had the Volkswagen Beetle, England had the BMC Mini, France had the uh, Citroën 2CV, and then Italy had the Fiat 500. Basically the same idea, a cheap mass-produced economy couple. Each country had its own spin on it. Each company had its own spin on it, which I think, you know, I think that's kind of cool. I think that's kind of cool indeed, Um, which is why I decided to do this series of podcasts anyway. Um, There there was a Barth version of the Fiat 500. There were several different versions of the Fiat 500. There was like a Fiat 500L, which is basically your luxury version. There was uh, an America version. Um, There was actually an America trim of this car. And get this, only 300 were produced for the American market. I don't know if there were 300 that were produced intended to sell in America and they never did, or they actually came over here and did sell. I would imagine that of 300, there's probably maybe half that left around and the ones that are left around are probably very rare um so i should probably do some research to find um an american spec fiat 500 from this era that would be that would be like doug demiro's dream to find something like that super quirky and like super rare and like you know only if you know you sort of thing totally do an amazing video on it just like he always does um so yeah moving on there were several other trims available as well there was about yeah 300 made for the u.s market and they also had a small panel van version so i guess you know these these are sort of things you know what i really appreciate about the fiat 500 i appreciate about the fiat 500 that that it was an Italian car, but it was not what Americans typically think of Italian cars. I mean, if you remember way back a couple of months ago when I did my podcast on Italian cars, we in America tend to think that Italian cars are Ferrari or Lamborghini, that they are, you know, fast, they are exotic. That's only because Italian cars, real Italian cars, if I could put it that way, haven't been sold in America. I mean, the most real Italian cars that have been sold in America are the Fiat. But get this, Fiat has been announcing that it's going to pull out of the American market any day now. I mean, I think they might have already done that. They're not selling any more new cars. So, like, there's a reason why we don't know what true Italian cars are like because we have them. I mean, we just don't get any of them. Italian cars are dominating in Europe where their home is. I mean, that's where people know them. That's where people buy them. That's where people um, rely on them. That's when people, you know, you know, buy them as a viable source of entertain- uh, ent- entertainment, as a viable source of transportation, not here in America. So evidenced by the fact that a lot of people don't know these two cars i mean it's like i just so happened to split up these two cars in the podcast um these four cars in the series of podcasts into the two best well-knowns and uh, or the two best known hmm, how do i say that the two most well-known cars and the two least known cars as far as these you know beloved european cars of old are um yeah it's like everybody knows the mini Everybody knows the Volkswagen Beetle, wherever you are in the United States, wherever you are on Earth, everybody knows those cars. Not everybody knows the Citroën 2 Chevaux, and not everybody knows the the, 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 the Fiat 500. Things were not were not as popular. Um, They weren't produced for as long, and they simply weren't as popular. They didn't produce nearly as many of them. So that would make a lot of sense. It would make a lot of sense as to why this is sort of a thing that's kind of, you know— not a secret it's not like it's a secret it's just something that we don't we don't typically you know hear about um which is which is perfectly fine this is why there's podcasts like this so people can learn about the different cars of old and whatnot so people can learn about you know other sorts of things um it's it's amazing it's amazing really that we we have the opportunity for us to learn about these cars that we have the opportunity to see what italy has actually produced instead of just lamborghini ferrari uh maserati and all the cliche fast italian cars because i mean after a while those aren't interesting anymore i mean they all have the same basic formula oh they've got this massive v12 that's a uh, mid-engine that's rear-wheel drive that gated manual transmission this that that yeah you know that's great but your ferrari testarossa your lamborghini diablo marcella go uh, ferrari la ferrari whatever i mean 
After a while, it just gets boring. You can only talk about those cars so much. Sometimes you gotta have to bring it back and talk about reality. Talk about the normal people's cars. Because, I, you know, newsflash, most people are not in the price range, are not in the socioeconomic class for them to be driving a Lamborghini Diablo. Most people are in the socioeconomic class that's going to be causing them to drive a Fiat 500 instead of a Lamborghini Marcielago or a Lamborghini Diablo or a Ferrari um, 458 Italia or something of that sort. I mean, that's why I think it's important to discuss these cars. So the Fiat 500 is very important as far as Italian cars go, not only because it is a car that is so famous, a car that really brought, you know, the car to Italy. I mean, not to say that there wasn't cars in Italy, but it really made it accessible and available to everybody. It's also um, important for our perception, for our understanding of car. Uh, Italy has not always made fast, super, you know, attractive, um, um, sports cars. Italy has made normal cars. In fact, most of Italy's cars are normal and most of them are small, you know, efficient cars like Fiat. Most of them are not Lamborghinis and there's nothing wrong with Lamborghinis. It's just, let's be honest, that's not what most people drive. Um, that's not realistic per se. So yeah, there you have it. Um, so please stay tuned for the next segment of this podcast in which I'm going to be discussing, um, basically what is, what is the, the comparison between the Fiat 500 and the Citroën 2CV? Um, what, do, what do they compare as far as being side by side and where one succeeds and when one fails in these categories I will be mentioning? So please stay tuned after the break. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Alrighty, welcome back, folks. After the break, um, in the previous segment, we discussed the Fiat 500, um, the sorts of things that made it unique, the sorts of things that made it special, a bit about its history. So in this segment, we are going to be discussing um, the comparison between the two cars. So why don't we get started? So um, we are going to be discussing them um, in very much the same way we discussed the BMC Mini and the Volkswagen Beetle. We're going to be discussing them in terms of two categories here in terms of influence in terms of uh, no in terms of four categories pardon me um in terms of influence in terms of styling in terms of legacy that they've left behind and in terms of technology slash features so let's talk about influence okay the two versus each other uh, i will say that the citroen 2 cv had a lot more influence versus the fiat 500 and here's why i say that the Citroen 2 CV was produced for 42 years, from 1948 to 1990. And think of it, the Citroen 2 CV was produced all over the world. In anywhere the 
And if just a bit of history for you all, if Great Britain was the greatest empire the world had ever known, I mean, France was probably the one that came right behind it. Everywhere that Great Britain touched, France touched somewhere nearby too. And that's the thing that I wanted to drive home. That's the point that I kind of wanted to drive home. Because the French have had a lot more colonial power, a lot more influence over the globe than the Italians have, you find the Citroën two chevaux not just in France, but you find it in a lot of Francophone countries, and you find it in a lot of countries that have been touched by the French Empire when the French Empire was still a thing. So that's why they're produced all over the world. I mean, they had factories in South America. Um, they had factories in Europe. They had it in Eastern Europe. They had it all over the place, the Citroën two chevaux, um, which sadly enough, it never made it to North America. It's not like they were rolling around Canada and Quebec or something. But it basically touched everywhere that the French had touched. So as far as influence goes, I would definitely say the Citroën 2 Chevaux has it in the bag. Um, it's, it's a question of really what's been going and what's not been going as far as the car company goes. Um, the Fiat 500 was only produced in Italy. It was only produced in Italy, and it was only produced in Italy for about 18 years. And then they either changed it, or they put it out of production for sure, and they they came up with a successor for it, the successor which is not nearly as well-known or which is not nearly as beloved as far as the international community goes. And so, yeah, I would say as far as influence goes, Citroën 2 Chevaux has it. Um, as far as styling, okay. Now, not to dump on French cars. French cars have never really been the most attractive cars. And we're taking Italian cars, which are arguably the most attractive cars. So, anybody can if these cars, which one is the attractive one? Fiat 500 is definitely more attractive than the, the Citroën 2 Chevaux. The Citroën... I feel like French cars have always been designed with quirkiness in mind and with functionality above all else, not style. For them, it's purely practicality over style when it comes to car design. Uh, the Citroën 2 Chevaux is not pretty. I am not going to even pretend to think that it is pretty. The car is not pretty. It's not even trying to be pretty. In fact, it's so ugly, it's kind of cute. I mean, this thing is... It's like it sits higher in the back than it does in the front. It has these fender arches, but it has these fender skirts. So have you seen cars with fender arches and fender skirts? You can there's kind of like there two different styling philosophies in cars. You can have like a central body and then fenders that kind of look like they're attached to the body. Or you can have like what they call pontoon styling. Pontoon styling like one hole in it and the fenders are integrated into the entire um, body of the car. Well, this one, you know, when you have pontoon styling, it's a lot easier to get away with fender skirts and making them look good this one has like fenders attached to the body but it also has fender skirts so it almost looks like they forgot to cut out the wheel arch for the rear wheels because it's just a straight line to the back and which Citroens of this time tended to do that anyway so I was just like I always thought that was kind of odd and then the, the headlights stuck out in a weird way and then for a while they went to like square headlights and like man bless this car's heart goodness but it's just not pretty it really isn't like it just looks odd and then you know with this roll top convertible thing whatever this fixed uh, profile convertible that uh, when you re basically remove the center part of the roof by just rolling it down the canvas and whatnot i mean that so like especially when you when you rolled it down it was kind of like this whole pile of folded fabric in the back and just it just looked bad I'm sorry. It just looked bad. I feel sorry for this car. It's just like that really weird, awkward, just what is that thing? Like, and it's, because it's so weird and awkward, that's kind of what makes it kind of charming. But like, it's just so weird and awkward. I mean, there is no 
there is no cutting it or slicing it. It's just odd. And if you ever look up the Citroen 2 Chevaux, you will find out that it is genuinely just an odd looking car. I mean, there's there's not really any styling out there to redeem it. So yeah, there, there you have it. I mean, like, it's not, that's just my honest opinion on the styling of this car. It's not attractive. It's not trying to be attractive. It's kind of just there. Um, and bless its heart, but like, that for me. The f- is very well designed. It's cute. And it's meant to be cute. It's kind of like how the Volkswagen Beetle was designed. The Volkswagen Beetle was cute. It was meant to be cute. The BMC Mini was cute. It was meant to be cute. The Fiat 500 was cute. It was meant to be cute. The Italians of all the car companies out there, or of all the car producing countries, the Italians get styling the most. They understand that this car had a cute personality, so they designed it to be cute and that is not a problem at all folks that is a great win in my book of all things is the fact that they understood the styling of the car they understood what it ought to have been like and that I can't say I have a problem with it I mean it has little round headlights it didn't have much of a grill um so it was like a small little dainty grill but in place where they didn't have a giant grill there was like the fiat badge and there was like these two chrome strips came out of either side of it and then the rear i mean it, it was it was actually it was actually rear engine so it didn't even really need a grill up front i believe it still had like an air intake or whatnot but like the grill on the back the little slits in the back and even the racing version that needed to have like a giant intercooler on it like even that looked good i mean this infinitely looks better than the Citroen 2 Chevaux. There is no, there is no cutting it. There is no slicing it. The car is just a better looking car. Um, it may not be as influential as the Citroen 2 Chevaux, but it's definitely better looking. And for me, I really don't care about influence when it comes to my car. So if I was going to buy one of these, I'm definitely buying a Fiat 500. It's probably not as reliable, but man, the Citroen 2 CV is just so dang ugly. I can't just, I couldn't bring myself to drive it. I mean, like, it's that ugly. It's so ugly, it's cute. Um, So moving on to legacy. Um, Both have left a legacy. Both have left a legacy in the sense that... The Citroën 2 Chevaux, as far as French classic car culture goes, the little amongst the French, they are a proud people. They are proud of their product. They are proud of their Citroën, and they are proud of the car that they produce. They are proud of their people's car. And you know what? That's something to be commended. I am 2% French, but I am Haitian. I have French culture. Um, we, were fr- we are a Francophone country. Um, you know, the thing is, I, I appreciate that about my 2% French ancestry. They are proud of what they've created and they are loyal to it to the very end. Um, Italians, on the other end, Italians didn't let the Fiat 500 live long enough. I could go into research about why the Fiat 500 ended so early, especially when other cars of its vintage of its class tended to not go out of production so early for whatever reason those cars tend to stay in production for a very 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 long time um but it's just it's kind of odd it really is just kind of odd why it ended so early granted i will say as far as legacy goes they kept it alive they realize, I guess, that they ended it too early. So 50 years after it first came out in 1957, in 2007, they reintroduced it. They reintroduced a modern, retro-styled version of it that is still being produced uh, today and that is still zipping around the roads of Europe and uh, North America. They finally brought it to North America. So, like, you know what? I think... As far as legacy goes, the, the the legacy of the Fiat 500 is a lot more tangible than the legacy of the Citroën 2 Chevaux. The Citroën 2 Chevaux is still being restored by classic car enthusiasts and whatnot. You can still find them rolling around some Francophone countries, uh, France, Belgium, some African countries and whatnot. But like, you know... I would have to give it to this, the, the Fiat 500 in this case for his legacy. Because they realize what they did. 
they ended it too early, so they brought it back, and it's been hugely successful for them since. So, uh, Legacy, as well, as far as what the cars left behind, does this car is a more tendency in the fact that there is a modern version of it being produced. I'm gonna have to give it to this one because of the four cars I've discussed in this two series, this two part podcast, if you will, um, the Citroen Two Chevaux is the only one that doesn't live on. It's the only one that doesn't live on. It does not have a modern equivalent. The BMC Mini is the ancestor of today's Mini Cooper. The Volkswagen Beetle, even though they recently killed it, they created the new Beetle, and they had two generations of new Beetle that are still rolling around. And this car, the Fiat 500, has a modern version of it as well. Citroën 2 Servo is the only one that doesn't have one. So, like, as far as the legacy goes, the other ones have been smart enough to keep the legacy of the car going for at least some period of time. But, you know, uh, not the French. I guess the French decided that it was it was good for a period of time. It was over. There ain't no point in bringing it back. And honestly, I don't even know how they would retro style something like that because, goodness, I, it would be as ugly as sin. They wouldn't be able to retro style it because nobody wants a car styled like that anymore. But uh, moving on, let me be uh, let me be a bit more time. As far as technology and features, go. These cars were revolutionary in the same way the Volkswagen Beetle and the, the BMC Mini were revolutionary. Uh, the Citroën 2 Chevaux front-wheel drive car. Granted, it's not the modern setup of front-wheel drive transversely mounted engine with um, liquid water cooling that I ranted so much about the BMC Mini, but it had front-wheel drive. Uh, front-wheel drive, nonetheless, doesn't necessarily have to be a transversely mounted engine. There are longitudinally mounted engines that are front-wheel drive. I believe some sobs were like that in the day. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be transversely mounted, but it was a front-wheel drive air-cooled engine. Um, front-wheel drive, as you know, is pretty much the norm for cars nowadays, unless it's more of a performance-oriented car than it's going to have a rear-wheel drive from the factory. Um, yeah, so front-wheel drive, uh, obviously space-saving techniques, space-saving measures um, as far as technology goes. Um, I would say um, for this... Both cars were, were, you know, pretty typical of the day as far as technology went for these sorts of cars. But what edges the Citroen 2CV out um, is the fact that the Citroen 2CV had radial tires. And it was one of the first cars to feature radial tires because Michelin had just come out with them. And because it has radial tires, I'm going to have to give it to it. That is something that has been a huge deal for cars nowadays. Bias ply tires just weren't as weren't as safe as radial tires. Radial tires are a lot safer because of their construction. They're a lot more rigid, able to handle a lot more than bias ply tires. And the fact that an economy car had radial tires, that is way ahead of its time as far as technology goes. So yeah, the Citroen 2CV just edges out the Fiat 500 in this category. So here we are right now. I mean, we, you know, at the end of segment three, um, you know, the Fiat 500 won in styling and legacy, but the Citroen 2CV won in influence and technology. So, you know, it's kind of a toss up at this point. I mean, it, there might be an obvious winner to you if you're listening, but you won't find out until the next segment. So please stay tuned and make sure you uh, continue listening to us after this break. So thank you very much. Do you work in the world of marketing and advertising? Are you a media buyer or the owner of an agency? Have you been looking for a podcast to help stay on top of all the goings on of those worlds? The GSMC Marketing News Podcast is dedicated to keeping you up to date on all things concerning marketing and advertising. Get the latest marketing news from what major businesses have planned for the coming year to the newest trends in advertising from podcasts, digital and streaming to the old standbys of radio, television and billboards. The GSMC Marketing News Podcast has you covered whether you're a marketing agent or a business trying to expand your brand.
All righty, folks. Welcome back um, after the break. Um, in the last segment, we we basically had a head-to-head of the Citroën 2 Chevaux versus the Fiat 500, and I I said we were sort of in a toss-up. We don't know really which one. It doesn't. It's not very clear about which one's going to win, which one I'm going to think is better, um, but I will tell you um, my personal opinions of both of the cars before I tell you which one I'm going going to choose as the better of these two cars in this uh in this comparison if you will um my personal opinion of the Citroen 2 Chevaux this car has always been a very intriguing car to me and you know the thing is French cars have always been intriguing to me in general because French cars seem to be very successful in France Everywhere else, French cars are kind of just quirky, are kind of not really paid much attention to. So, like, why is that? Why is it that way? I've always wondered, how come French cars have almost barely made an appearance here in the United States? Not to say that they haven't. You had the Renault Le Car. Like back in the 80s and you had some other I think it was like a Pojo at some point that was sold in America but never in such a grand presence as German cars another you know the European cars as far as English cars there's plenty there's tons of English cars on the roads there's tons of German cars on the roads there's a fair number of Italian cars on the roads and there's, there's there's a bunch of Swedish cars on the roads too there's a bunch of different European sorts of cars how come French cars never made it over here to the states I find that very odd very odd indeed and you know the thing is I I always want to I always like to wonder is that what it would be like if French cars came to the United States. What would it be like? What sorts of reputations would they have? Are they reliable? Are they not reliable? Like, we have our stereotypes, we have our general overgeneralizations, if I could put it that way, of every car um, co- producing country. Um, the English tend to make very beautiful cars that are not very reliable. The French tend to make very quirky cars, but we don't know what they're like. But we only know we only say they're quirky is because we're not familiar with them. I mean, the Germans tend to make very well built cars that are over engineered. The Italians m- tend to make very pretty cars that are live fast, die young, leave a sexy corpse. Um, the Swedish tend to make very quirky cars too, very quirky cars that are very obsessed with safety. I mean, like Volvo. Uh, the Japanese tend to make very well built, very um efficient and very reliable cars the south koreans tend to make very cheap cars but now that's beginning to change too so like what is what is the deal with french cars and because i'm so curious about french automobiles i have to be curious as to what the citroen 2 chevaux would be like if it came to america um I always thought it was really interesting. I I don't think I ever had a toy car of a Citroën 2 Chevaux, but I've seen them in pictures, especially from French class back in middle and high school. I mean, these are like French icons. They used to have like doodles of them in the textbooks and whatnot. I mean, like, you know, the Citroën 2 Chevaux is like, you know, France's 57 Chevy. I mean, it's the quintessential French car. The You know, like the 57 Chevy is the quintessential American car. So what what is it like? That's what I want to know. That's that's what my personal opinion is, is what is it like? Because I don't know if I have a personal opinion. I just don't know enough about it yet. Like, I should probably do a, you know, a, a podcast dedicated to just that car, just so I can, you know, exhaustively do research on it and find out everything about it. But styling, you all know I'm not a fan of the styling. I'm a fan of how quirky it is, though, and how unique it is. This is definitely a unique automobile. There is no other car like the Citroën 2 Chevaux. There will dare I say never be another car like the Citroën 2 Chevaux. It's just it's that unique. It's that quirky. It's that like, it's, it's, it's odd almost like it is definitely odd. It's not almost odd. It's totally odd, but it's odd about the fact that this is so different 
from any other car we've seen that there's not even one that can even come close to it. I mean, the cars that I am um, not reviewing, that I am discussing in these podcasts, um, as far as these old European cars, uh, you know, these old European economy cars, I mean, these are the cars that are sort of, kind of, the most similar. I, I personally like it because of the fact it's so dang weird. I like weird cars. I like weird cars. I like learning about weird cars. I like seeing weird cars. In fact, I think they have a bunch of these at the Tampa Bay Automobile Museum that I am going to take a trip up to at some point to go and visit and to go see. Um, but yeah, there's, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. I mean, that's, that's the Citroen 2 Chevaux. My personal opinion on the Fiat 500. I love this little car. I mean, this little car is such a pop culture icon. It fits so well on the big screen and whatnot. I mean, like, you can't just not love the Fiat 500L. It's hard not to, uh, not the Fiat 500L, uh, the Fiat 500. It's hard not to love it. Um, because it is pretty, it is cute, it is, it is, uh, it's adorable. It's like a little teddy bear, but in car form. I mean, like, how do you not like this car? Like, let's, how do you not like it? It just, it looked, the looks like a small little city, Italian little, you know, car, like the Vespa or something, something super Italian. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's adorable. It's lovable. You can't really hate it. It's like something you can't get upset with. Are they reliable? Probably not. Italian cars are not known for their reliability, but you know, it doesn't matter because it's cute. Like it makes up for it. It's like, you know, that one, that one person, you know, that just can't do anything right. But you know, it's like a bless their heart sort of thing. Like you can't get mad at them, but they're like, yeah, maybe they're not too bright, but they have a good heart. And that's what, that's what the, the, uh, the Fiat 500 is. It has a good heart. It has a good heart. It means well. Um, and you know, the thing is, it beats the Citroen 2 Chevaux in styling. It beats it in, in, in legacy because it still rolls around the, 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 the car world today um, in its modern form. Uh, what I'll say about the modern one, the modern one, uh, unfortunately, it's a Chrysler product. That's the problem. I mean, these cars, could, these are potential. But if like a Japanese company merge with an Italian company, which the, the Japanese probably just, you know, are probably, they, they probably know better than to merge with a, a, you know, a car company that has reliability issues because they are known for their reliability. But if they were to like completely take over production of the Fiat 500L and made it like with a Toyota engine and like, you know, put it off of a Toyota base platform, I mean, it would be a wonderful little car. Currently in its current state though, it's, it's not a good car. It's not a good car simply because it's a Chrysler product. That's that's what's kind of sad about it. Uh, Chrysler has managed to maim this one too, has managed to maim the legacy of this one as well. And that's what's kind of upsetting about it. Um, frankly, there's not much one can say about that. It's a Chrysler product, the modern one. So there, I, I obviously don't think of it very favorably. The old one, though, however, is really cute. In fact, the new one, though, is is cute for the sake of being cute. It's it's I guess they have evolved their you know original names. Uh, that have modernized these old economy cars. This one has probably stayed closest to its true form. The 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 Volkswagen Beetle became a novelty. It was not an economy car. Um. The, the the BMW um based Mini Cooper is more of a luxury car than anything. It's also a novelty. Um this one is an economy car still. I mean the the, the modern Fiat five hundred is still an economy car. So I will give it that. But as far as what I choose personally between the ones that um that I like the most, I would have to say I like the Fiat five hundred the most. Fiat 500 the most because of its legacy, because of its pop culture status as a cute little car that people absolutely love across the world, or at least across Europe. I don't know about the whole world if they know about it, but oh, because it's styled much, much better too. I know I'm shallow. I'm going for styling on this one. It's just the two chevaux just looks bad. I mean, it's look. I mean, there's not really a way to get it because it's such. 
It's such a specific sort of thing. It's such a specific sort of car, a specific sort of sect of the car culture. I mean, it doesn't just have that broad mass appeal that even though it's more influential, it influenced a lot more um, as far as car stuff goes. But the Fiat 500 is simply a better looking car and it has more it has more crowd favorites. I mean, because it's a better looking car, because it's it's. It's sort of like the underdog, like of all of these cars, like of all of these cars that I mentioned made the top like 10 list of the best cars, the most influential cars of the 20th century. You had the Ford Model T, which I didn't mention on these lists, but the Ford Model T was named the most uh, influential. Then number two was like the Mini. Then number three was the Citroen 2 Chevaux. Then number four was the Volkswagen Beetle as far as um most influential cars of the 20th century from 1900 to 1999. Um, 100 years cars influenced in that 100 years. I don't even think the Fiat 500 made it on the list. But like that's what's kind of charming about it is the fact that the Fiat 500 is sort of an underdog. The Fiat 500 is sort of that car that people love, but they know it's not that great. And that's why I love it. I know it ain't that great. I know it's, it's, but it's, it's cute. It's cute. And you can't get over how cute it is. You can't get over the crowd favorite of it. And I think that's probably why Italy has been able to pull off bringing them back. Even though they're terrible cars, but they've been able to bring it back because they're going off of that cuteness. I mean, it's like someone who just does, pu it's like your puppy who does puppy dog eyes at you. I mean, they could have knocked over your favorite vase and broken it, but like they do the puppy dog eyes and then you instantly melt. You'll be like, okay, it's okay, Fido. Just don't do it again. Like it's like it's because the car breaks down. It's just so cute. Like you just don't want to get rid of it. Like, it can do nothing wrong because it's so cute. I mean, like, that's kind of how it is. I mean, and that's the way I see it. Uh, we discussed this podcast. Let me, let me, you know, wrap up the, the, this series, if you will. We discussed the beloved European economy cars of old, starting out with the Volkswagen Beetle and the BMC Mini in the last podcast, which is the first installment of this series, and then finishing off with the Fiat 500 and the Citroën 2 Chevaux, um, De Chevaux in French. Um, this is, this is truly a class of automobiles that I would say is underappreciated. We don't realize how greatly these automobiles have influenced us in our lives, in our day-to-day -day lives, in our daily lives, um, as far as car culture goes. We don't realize how much these cars have influenced us. They've influenced us a lot more than we give them credit for. So, yeah, um... Yeah, that's what it is. Um, you will remember that my favorite from the last episode was the Volkswagen Beetle. And my favorite from this episode is the Fiat 500. So please, more um, thank you for listening to this GSMC Car Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, David Lucy Mabel, and I thank you very much once again for listening. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, leave us a like, leave us a message, subscribe, um, leave us a nice comment and a nice review because that really helps us. And thank you so much, folks. And just have a good night and keep on loving cars. Bye-bye. Uh, You've been listening to the GSMC Car Podcast, part of the GSMC Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type GSMC into your favorite podcast app to find all of the shows from the GSMC Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, from business news to weird news. Please subscribe to the podcast and follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you've enjoyed today's episode.